Let's see if we can get Erin Murphy to join us again. We are having some this morning on our Instagram feed. Oh, there we go. Hello. Hey, Erin, how are you? I'm well, Caitlin, how are you? I'm doing well. Great, Great. okay. Here. That worked. Great. Okay. <laughs> gotta love technology. I know, I know. You just gotta just gotta try again sometimes. All right. How are you? It is great to actually talk to you and see you. It's been a while. It has. It really has. It's been a minute. Now I've I've been doing well, thankfully. Uh just recently recovered from COVID, but now that that's out of my life, oh, things Lord. are great. I am glad that you are recovered. <laughs> Thank you. You and me both. Thankfully, we're mild, but yeah. I can see how that would turn severe very, very fast. Good. Yeah, I'm glad it was just a mild case. Gosh, that's crazy. Well, yeah. good. I'm glad you are back with us in the land of the living. Um, <laughs> so everyone, this is Aaron Murphy. He is a baritone. And he's going to talk to us today about teaching baritones. Aaron and I know each other from undergrad. We both attended Lee University together. And then actually we both went to the same grad school, but not at the same time. We both attended McGill University for our masters. Um, so we have very similar experience. And now we're both getting our doctorate at different schools. Um, he's at Indiana University. I'm at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, but we do commiserate from time to time about, <laughs> about you know, the, the hurdles and the obstacles of, of what it is to get a doctorate. So we're both getting our doctorate in voice. Um, we both teach. Um, Aaron is a wonderful performer, a wonderful teacher. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. Um, now we do have some icebreaker questions that people oh. left. The first one is from someone you know, Morgan Gray asks, why is your hair so good? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. I, I guess I'm a little atypical from a lot of guys I know I actually use conditioner. What a concept. <laughs> okay. You know? All right. But well, I think that's what you're because... supposed to do with curly hair, aren't you? Like, you don't even have to wash it that often. You're just supposed to condition it. That's what John says anyway. Yeah. A lot of people <laughs> do that. They'll, they'll use like a cleansing conditioner or um, something <laughs> that will not strip the oils out of your hair because I, you know, that was a mistake I made back when my hair was first really long. In fact, that's, that's when you met me. It was down, you know, middle of my oh shoulder my gosh. blades. I wish I could pull up a picture and show everybody what your hair used to look like. Aaron, when I met him, had like hair out to here. It was amazing. That's how we knew you, really. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so much. And I didn't know at the time to not shampoo it so often because I was just stripping oils out of it. So you know, a lot of trial and error. Thankfully, I found products that work for me. But hi, Morgan. Thank you so much for your question. <laughs> I so there you go. We cover all kinds of things in these interviews, hair care, you know, we'll see, we'll see what comes up next. <laughs> We're about the holistic singer, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, the first question I, I want to start out with is just kind of asking about your story, how you um, came to find music, and then more specifically, how you came to find um, teaching. Absolutely. Um, so my trajectory has been kind of the the, um, the quintessential success is not linear, where it's been very windy, lots of different areas, different disciplines even. Uh, there have been many times in my career where I've changed my major or changed away from this path. Um, but you know, I've been involved in music, like a lot of musicians from a very early age, piano, singing in children's choirs, yada, yada. Um, but classical voice never really kind of appeared to me until just before the end of my high school years. Um, I actually just stumbled upon a production of The Magic Flute from The Met. Okay. It was Julie Tamer's production uh, with Nathan Gunn, Miss Papageno, Matthew mm -hmm. Pantani, um, and then a Hungarian soprano we don't hear a lot anymore was Erica Miklosa was singing Queen of the Night. And at first my thought was, oh, this is an opera. I hate opera. What am I doing? But I just kept watching it. <laughs> <laughs> it just drew me in. I, I love that. Me. And so I knew by the end of it, I thought this is what I want to devote my life to. Mm. Um, so it's been a wonderful journey, a strange journey, but a wonderful journey. Yep. Somehow or another, there was a bassoon mixed in there. I don't know what happened to it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> a man of many talents. <laughs> yeah, just kind of, you know, a man of many. How much can I get paid for this? And how, you know, can you just, you know, <laughs> get get by with as little as possible? <laughs> But that's, isn't that, that's what getting a doctor, it's all about, right? Absolutely. It's like, 
I will do that if you pay me. <laughs> <laughs> but Love teaching that. came up actually really late. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of chance to do private lessons in undergrad or in my graduate work. I had a handful of high school students while I was at Lee, but nothing, no one that was terribly serious. Mm -hmm. um, and most of my teaching has then come just sporadically. I've had very little of a real studio. Um, most of my students have just been in and out. And what's been great about that is it's given me a chance to meet a lot of different types of people who would be interested in taking voice mm -hmm. and to acquaint myself with a lot of different voices and different issues within mm. approaching teaching styles. So it's been, while it wasn't like ideal, it's been really interesting. So now the bulk of my teaching is actually in a school of education. I teach a study skills course in the IU School of Education outside of the musical entirely. So my teacher brain is so much more education focused than it is music these days. <laughs> interesting, but that's really interesting. And I think something that a lot of people don't realize is your professors in music school a lot of times don't have an education background which is really interesting when i when i found that out i was like oh okay sometimes i was like that makes a lot of sense <laughs> <laughs> yes. but it really it's it's i i also i got my one of my degrees in my undergrad was in education and oh my gosh i am so glad i did that because then for the first time when i stepped into a classroom my first college teaching job was a music appreciation job at, um, at Chattanooga State. And I remember walking in and, and being so thankful that I had had an education course or, you know, this education background, because otherwise I would have been very intimidated. But it is all about just trying things and kind of seeing what you're interested in and, and seeing what you're good at. And um, that's, that's neat that you're kind of doing all these, these different things and able to teach these, these different classes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled with it. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, so let's talk about teaching baritones. So the first question I like to ask about this, well, first of all, you know, we make fun of baritones a lot because we just say you guys don't have to warm up. You just like talk a little bit, blah, right? And then you're ready to sing, right? <laughs> so we're gonna find out today if that's actually true. So what is the same about teaching students in your own voice type and all other voice types? Um, the same things are actually not found in the voices themselves. They're actually found in the studio climate or the lesson climate that you build. So um, being able to be not only a, um, a musical mentor, but also a, a personal mentor. These students mm. bring lots of things into the studio every week. And there is a kind of a balance that you have to build between student and teacher that is both beneficial, but also you are learning as well. You know, it's not just a, a what, there's an educational writer named Paulo Freire who wrote about this banking method of education where students come to us for information and we simply give it back to them and there's no reversal where we're not learning anything from them. Mm -hmm. But we have to. They can teach us so, so much. So really when it comes to teaching different voice types, there's very little, there's not a whole lot of similarity, I guess, in, but... Oh, I cut out. Oh, there, there you are. Yeah, you just cut out for, yeah, you're there. You just cut out for just a second. You're back. <laughs> gotcha. Our Wi-Fi is strange here, and I don't know why. Um, That's all right. <laughs> but as I was saying, the, the real similarities lie in, in your teaching styles and less so in the voices. There's some similarities, of course, teaching, musically speaking, but really it's the, it's, it's the approach that you have. Sure. I love that because I think, you know, recently I've just been – listening to some other interviews on social media platforms and things about people's experiences um, with their music education and um, and things that they wish had been different. And a lot of people talk about that, that relationship with their teacher and how some people have had negative experiences with their teacher. And I think that it's really important for us as voice teachers to be aware of how important, not only teach, like having the knowledge to teach voice is one thing, right? And mm -hmm. that's really, really important, of course, if you're going to be a voice teacher. Right. But the other thing is really being aware of that student-teacher relationship and making sure that you're nurturing the student in a way that helps them grow, but also helps them, um, you know, just from a mental health perspective, helps them become a better person. And um, I think that I think that's really important. I love hearing you talk about that um, because I think that as voice teachers, we really, really have to consider both of those things if we want to be influential and um, good mentors. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. I love that. Um, so what are the differences now in teaching baritones versus teaching other voice types? Since you're a baritone, I'd love for you to speak to this a little bit. Sure. Um, there's actually quite a few standard similarities. Of course, you know, you're looking for, for certain things in certain voices. But the real differences for me personally come in where the passaggi lie and helping them navigate properly mm -hmm. for their voice and for their anatomy. Uh, so helping a soprano navigate their, their various registers is not going to be the same as helping a baritone navigate his, his passaggi, you know. Um, so generally speaking, for the passaggi, baritones, it starts at about B3 for us. And mm -hmm. it's like anywhere between B3 and E4 is generally where it kind of starts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a pretty wide, a pretty wide range of what would be called primo passaggio. Um, and it's going to be different for every student. It also changes over time. Uh, so for example, when I first started, uh, Tony Deaton, God love him, had a hard time getting me to sing a middle C. I don't know why. I just couldn't <laughs> get it. Bless that man. I just could not get there. Um, but nowadays, my primo passaggio begins at about C sharp, D. So on certain days, it's even D E flat, you know. But that's generally where it starts. And at that point, we then flip over into our head voices. Um, so helping them navigate that without pressing it. Baritones tend to press a lot. And I know that's a, that's a stereotype, but... <laughs> I found it to be true. I really yeah. have in my own voice and in many of my colleagues and students that I've taught, we, we do tend to press. There is this, this sensation of, okay, to get a higher note, I have to hunker down and just press it on out and clamp down on my throat. It's like, that is the last thing you want to do. That's not what you're supposed to do. It feels so good though. <laughs> like, oh my God. When I see, especially when I see young students, you know, freshmen, sophomores in college yeah. doing it. I'm just like, oh, oh mm -hmm. God, <laughs> you yeah. know, poor thing. Mm -hmm. um, but so to, to better answer, to kind of round back to the question, that's where I see the major difference is how we navigate getting them from one register to the other, where that register lies and how we would approach that with them. Sure. Yeah, I love that. And this might be going on to other questions that I have, but do you have any verbiage or ways that you help students think about not pressing? Because it's such a, such a temptation for, I think, baritones and tenors and, and well, everybody in, in different parts of their voice. But when they feel like they, they are approaching somewhere that's, that's hard for them to sing, it is a tendency to try harder. And a lot of times mm -hmm. the way that we try harder is by involving muscles and, and things that don't need to be involved. So is there any, any kind of thing that you do to encourage that? And again, I might be kind of jumping ahead to, to later questions here. That's okay. Um, well, it, it does depend on the maturity of the student. You know, if someone's familiar enough with voice that they can kind of get some more technical things, I, I would tell them to, first of all, you know, don't, don't press on your breath support. Let it simply lie in suspension. It's there to be an underpinning, not to be a driving force. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, breath is going to be flowing, but we actually have to do remarkably little to get it to flow and to flow evenly. That's mm -hmm. something that a lot of baritones don't know. They're just like, oh, let me be an organ bellows and blow as much air out as possible. It's like, eh, no. right, right. You're, you're going to want to keep some of that reserve for yourself. It's like a savings yeah. account. You're going to want to keep that for later. Um, so that's, it'd be different for them versus young students. What I would tell a young student is, okay, that sounds like you're really trying right there. And it sounds like you're afraid of what's going to come next. Fall flat on your face. Mm. Just sing it comfortably for you. And if it's not successful, congratulations. You did something really, really hard. And that's a, something to be celebrated. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. And I and that's something, again, that's coming up, I feel like, with all of the, the teachers I've talked to so far is giving permission student, uh, giving students the permission to fail, to experiment, and, you know, not worrying so much about making a perfect sound all the time, because that's not yeah. what lessons are about. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, 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 like, I love that. The studio should be a workshop. It should mm -hmm. be a chance for you to tr to try things. If it doesn't work, okay, we'll change it out. It's like, it's honestly like taking your car to a shop, you know, you, right. they're going to they're gonna work on things. It's not going to be running perfectly when you get there. That's the point where you're taking to the shop. 
if it was right. running perfectly, you would just go out on the road. You would go straight to the stage if everything was perfect. Right. Yeah. Treat it like a workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much to those of you that are joining us. I see some of you guys. If you have any questions as we're, um, as we're continuing, feel free to ask. Erin Murphy is a baritone, so we're talking about teaching baritones today. Um, so let's see. I have one more icebreaker question from Stephanie. She asks, what's the favorite place that you've ever sung? Interesting question. Ooh, that's an <laughs> interesting question. Um, wow. There, there's actually a couple. It's hard for me to pick favorites anyways. I'm a Libra, and you're a Libra. You know this. Sometimes mm -hmm. decision making is not our mm -hmm. point. <laughs> yeah, just, speak that truth. Right. right. <laughs> Someone asked me the other day, actually, like, what's your favorite 90s song? I went completely blank because I have, like, so many I love, right? Yeah, right. But if I had to narrow it down to a top three, just, again, I can't pick a favorite. A top three would be, I, you know, I was blessed to sing at the second inauguration of Barack Obama. With That's the right. Choir. That's you right. Know, Speaking of, uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't solo work, but man, what an opportunity and mm -hmm. what an unforgettable experience that mm -hmm. was. Um, I'd say, you know, my next one was uh, two summers ago. I did a program in New York called Teatro Nuovo, which is a mm -hmm. wonderful program, uh, all about the the basics and techniques of bel canto. So, if you're really interested in bel canto singing, wonderful program. I highly recommend. Uh, Will Crutchfield is a genius and a wonderful, wonderful mentor. Um, but our performances took place at Jazz at Lincoln Center. So it wasn't quite the Met, wasn't quite Lincoln Center, but still to be able to have Lincoln Center on that little slip that said, hey, you're covering a role. Look, cover, and we're, here we are. The playbill says Lincoln Center is just like. That's so cool. This is my life. That's oh, so cool. God. Yeah. And then my third has to be the Mac at IU. The, the stage is wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just a triumph to even get a role on that stage because something about IU Jacobs is that it is notoriously hard to get cast for the, for the first time. But once you're cast and you show that you're a good colleague, good worker, you'll, you'll get more. But it's that getting the foot in the door is tough. And so sure. when I finally got it and I got to perform as the Count in the Nozzi di Figaro, <sighs> Wonderful. That's great. Angel Congratulations. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's awesome. I, I can, I bet that's a great role for you, too. Oh, it was great. It was a lot of yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right, so moving on to our next question. What kind of vocal challenges do you see most often in students of your own voice type? And I don't know if you have anything else to add. We already talked about the pressing, the primo passaggio and all that stuff. But is there anything else that you see as a challenge um, to, to baritones when you teach them? Yeah, so actually on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's quite a few baritones that are very brassy, very tinny, and very bright. And to the point where a lot of people miscategorize them as tenors solely mm. by their timbre. They don't take into account the actual range of their voices and where they feel the most comfortable. They say, oh, you're a tenor because you sound like one. It's like, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so that does happen, you know, and I actually had a, for example, I had a wonderful colleague at McGill who, um, who had this very bright, very uh, pingy baritone sound. It, I kind of categorized him in my own mind more as like the baritone matin for like French, like French Baroque, which right. he excelled in. And he finally, you know, came to accept that himself. And he does that a lot now. And mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's another challenge. Sometimes those young men that have those super brassy sounds, and it's, they're, they're struggling to get richness and fullness. Part of it's time, you know, time and growth. But another thing is, is encouraging them to familiarize themselves with the space, all of the space in their head and in their throat. Um, a lot of times there's this feeling that the only space that we have, because this is actually taught sometimes, is right here. It's like, oh, you're just using the resonating cavities of your head. Well, we forget, Mr. Pedagog, that the resonating cavities of your head also include all of this back here. Sure. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. so, so much more that, if not properly encouraged, is cut off. And that's a crying shame. Because yeah. some of those guys that have that brilliance, that brassiness to it, mm -hmm. they don't have to work on the hardest thing baritones have to work on, which is squealo. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they don't have to work on that, lucky devils. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. I, I think something I found in my own studies and from teaching students is a lot of them are told about 
the focus or singing in the mask, which is fine. But but I think a lot of times when when you focus on that, then then you do lose that. You know, we talk about the chiaro scuro, right? The mm -hmm. the light dark, right? The dark, I guess. Um, yeah, light dark. So a lot of times when we focus so much on the bright and the forward, we lose a lot of that that beautiful mm -hmm. darkness too. And so, I, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that in my own journey, when I was a soprano and then, and then discovered that my my voice type or my voice lended itself more toward the mezzo-soprano repertoire, that was a huge revelation for me too, discovering that darkness in my own voice. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. I'm sure you get students from both ends of the spectrum and we have to find that balance of, of the lightness and the darkness and finding all of those resonances, yeah. Absolutely. There's a sweet spot. We just all got to mm -hmm. find it. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, so my last question of the day, what are three of your favorite vocal exercises specifically for baritones, specifically for your voice type? Sure. So um, the three specific vocalizes that I tend to really like are, um, I have one that is a, what, what a coach at Chatham would called flossing. And this actually works for really any student, but especially for baritones, it's really helpful in the passaggio and helping you navigate uh, between even, there's considerable differences even between half steps apart sometimes up there. Um, so it can, be, it can be a little tricky. So flossing is going on a neutral syllable, E or ah. I tend to, I tend to gravitate towards ah. Uh, especially in the passaggio, because there's a way you can shape an ah to to kind of get the acoustic space to lend itself to getting through it smoother. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not changing much, but it's just a matter of of, of collecting or gathering the voice. Something that the Italians call it raccolto, bringing the voice kind of more more center that can help baritones get through that that space. Um, so all flossing is is it's just going up. By half step back and then down by half step and back mm. it's real simple it's mm -hmm. actually kind of annoying to some people sounds but, annoying <laughs> right <laughs> it kind of is but and why why and this the coach was named rochelle rochelle young if anyone's curious um what she said and the way she pitched this was i call it flossing because think about flossing your teeth you know, you hate doing it. No one really cares to, to do that a lot. And your dentist is always yelling at you. <laughs> but if you floss your teeth every day for a month and then come back and see how different you feel, the difference is tremendous. And so I took that challenge when I was there. I was like, all right, this is an annoying exercise. I'm going to do this for the remainder of time that I'm here. So I had three weeks. By the end of it, you want to talk about unity of, of, of breath and tone. You want to talk about flexibility. You want to talk about tuning, because tuning is an issue for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was wonderful, and especially there in the passaggio. You know, I had just started learning about how to properly collect the voice without pinching it or anything like that to get me through those harder passages. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful revelation. So I highly recommend that. Also, something to note is um, for anyone watching, I have these vocalizes written out in notation. If anyone's interested, you can just, I guess, let Caitlin know or, um, and I'll be happy to send them along. Yeah, and I think that his, Aaron's um, account should be listed at the top of here too. So you can probably contact him as well. Yes. Um, Awesome. Thank you. And I'm actually kind of disappointed that you're not talking about the dance move. I was really hoping you'd give us like a dance move <laughs> glossing. Okay. All right. Well, next time. My coordination <laughs> is zero. Like I have been the bane of every choreographer's existence in every show I've ever been. <laughs> Those of you that don't know, Aaron is, he listed on, I, I took your biography from, from um, I think Facebook. <laughs> yeah. You, you were a self-proclaimed giant. So he, he just draws your eyes on stage. He's, he's, uh, how tall are you? Six? I'm six foot eight. Six, eight. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So a very striking stage presence. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when it. you had your, your, your big hair too. That was, that was great. Oh, yeah, the memories. Yeah. Oh, the memories. Yeah. <laughs> <was a> <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. So moving on to some different exercises, we got flossing is your number one. What are some mm -hmm. other exercises for baritones that you like to use? So another one is just a simple five tone scale up and back. Um, but modulating from E 
to mm -hmm. ah the top note and back, especially stopping and really working on that primo passaggio because the vowel is going to be shaped differently and approached differently in just before primo passaggio versus primo passaggio. So it's a, re it's, it's a common exercise for a lot of singers, but it's a really important one for baritones as they learn to navigate that, that space. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing when they go from E to an A, ah, say they hit, you know, D4 mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're having a hard time. It's very, very spread, they're pressing. So instead you get that chance to work with them on how to bring it forward forward like bringing really bringing the lips forward with all you're doing sure. you're not bringing much right. anything else forward but you get them to to sit in that discomfort and really work it almost like like taking hard clay and getting it softer like it, mm. needing it to being softer that's hard it's hard on your fingers but it's so necessary to get that clay to do what you want to do right Avoid the clay you know you're you're simply just kneading it into where it needs to be so it's right. a great opportunity to work on that Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know when I when I work with baritones and they come in and they say, you know, I can't sing around. Yeah. Like around D4. Like it gets really hard to sing. I'm always like, you're not alone. This is probably what we're going to work on for most of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So these are great. Yeah. OK, cool. And then the last one, your favorite vocal, your favorite vocal exercise for baritones. So the last one is one is one of my absolute favorites. It is borrowed from the magnificent, incomparable Lily Lehman from her book, How to Sing, simple as it is. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. exercise, I swear to you, has changed the foundation of how I sing. So I see its power for others. This exercise is called The Great Scale. And The Great Scale, all it is is simply as it implies, and it's a scale, but you take it very slowly. So whichever note you want to choose to start on, it's you modulate between E and A for each note. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to eventually do the entire exercise all the way up, all the way back in one breath. I'm convinced I will never be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Something to work towards. <laughs> yeah, like I'm sure one day I will, but right now I'm like, this ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my current teacher, Tim Noble, of course, he's, he's been doing that exercise for about 25 years now. And so he can do it. And I'm just like, show off. <laughs> I love that. So when so I first started, I had to stop every five notes and take a breath and, and go back. And now it's getting to where I can go up and over and come back down to five, but then I got to take a breath again. Mm. So what that does is it strengthens that breath foundation and gets us to, to focus less on the sound that we're making or the vowels that we're making until we get to a spot where we have to, but instead focus on our foundational support of our breath. What's mm. it doing? Where do I feel tension? Where do I feel activity? Because tension and activity aren't the same thing. Some people, you know, conflate the two. It's like, no, they're, they're very different. Mm. So it's a wonderful exercise to really explore what it is that your breath is doing to identify potential problems. And the exercise itself, if practiced properly, can help address those problems. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, and, and again, when you're talking about breath and you were talking about earlier, finding the flow of the breath versus versus pressing I find that's really really important and um a good way to think about that and, and when you're talking about activity versus what's the other word that you used tension tension yeah activity versus tension um my teacher dr melissa moldy she talks about putting the work where it belongs right so mm -hmm. only putting it where it belongs and and nowhere else not involving any of those additional muscles or or anything else that that um, needs to be involved, which I find really important. And I also love that, you know, you're talking about this exercise that you're still working on. I think that we, as singers in this culture that we have, you know, we're that microwave culture, everything happens really, really quickly. We're used to on Instagram, just watching, or TikTok, watching these really, really short segments. And we're not used to like the hard, long work that it takes to really build a skill. So, oh, yeah. you know, even as teachers, we have these exercises. I mean, goodness gracious, there's parts of my voice that I'm still working on, of course, and there's things that I want to be better at. And to do that, I have to have that that daily practice, which I'm not always great at, to be honest. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a struggle and it's hard. And um, I think that just hearing that reminder of, 
you know, you're still working on these exercises. You're still working on getting better. You still have these problem areas of your voice, or I shouldn't say problem areas, but these, these parts of your voice that are, that you're trying to improve, (laughs) right? Like it's, it's, I think it's really important to hear that. um, And important for students to hear that too, um, to be encouraged that, you know, we're never, we're never there. We're always getting better and that's good and that's okay. And that's just part of the process. Yeah. That, yeah. Un- that unending and wonderful becoming. You're always becoming. Mm. That's one of the most beautiful things about living. Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things, too, um, that, that at least drew me to being a musician in the first place, that you don't have that arrival point. There's always something to learn. You have languages. You have history. You have theory. You have vocal technique. Like, there's just so much to this practice and it's really it's attractive because it does include the whole person right talking going back to talking about your hair at the beginning of this <laughs> at the beginning of this session it includes the whole person you have fashion yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah great well thank you so much for joining us today Erin. it's really good to talk to you again it's been a while um i i love seeing all the successes that you're having and again i am so i i I am encouraged by you and also commiserate with you for getting that doctorate right now. I know how that is. So continue the fight, (laughs) continue jumping through those hoops. We can both do it. (laughs) We can do it. We'll make it somehow. (laughs) We'll make it. We'll make it. Great. All right. Well, I'll see you later on on social media. I'm sure if you want to reach out to Aaron, he has, um, he has graciously um, allowed you guys to use some of these exercises. He says he has some of those written down. So if you want to reach out to him, feel free. Um, I, I believe when I save this interview, I'll have his um, account linked at the bottom. So um, reach out to Aaron if you have any other questions about teaching baritones, and I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. Absolutely. Anytime. Great. All right. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Caitlin. <laughs>